awesome, awesome. All right, I want you to turn with me to, uh, and I, and I, and I want to get somewhere tonight, man. There's just such an anointing on freedom. Uh, I want you to, I, I just want to look, I want you to put your eyes on this. We got just absolutely devastated in a good way by, the, by, the, by worship tonight. When you get encountered by the love of God, nothing tenderizes the human heart like the love of God. And we cannot get enough than just sitting in this. Matthew twenty two thirty seven, 37. And Amariah, I'm going to run hard, so we're going to hit a lot of verses. Matthew twenty two thirty seven. 37. They ask Jesus, they go, what's the, what's the great commandment? And Jesus said, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart. Everybody say all. all. He says all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind. And Mark 13, the same verse, will add all your strength. So there are four dimensions of loving God. All your heart, all your soul, all your mind, and all your strength. Jesus says that's the greatest commandment and the greatest call on your life is to fully give your whole heart to Jesus. To love God with every fiber of your being. To flood to love God with your mind. What does that mean to love God with your mind? What does it mean to love God with your strength? To love God with your resources? To love God with your gifts? To love God with your finances? To love God with your emotions? To love God with your dreams? To love God with everything that you have? And what we encounter, that is the call of God over your life. And I want every one of you to know Jesus prayed. Can you put this up here, uh, Amari? John 17, 26. John 17, 26. Jesus says, I have declared to them, good job, to them your name, and I will declare it, that the love with which you loved me would be in them and I in them. Do you know what Jesus' prayer for you is? Is that you would love him with the same intensity that the Father loves him. That's what he says, that the love with which you loved me would be in them. Jesus' prayer for you is that you would love Jesus the way the Father loves Jesus. I want you to know that prayer is going to get answered. The Father is going to give Jesus a bride that loves him more than anything else. The Father is not going to give to Jesus a bored bride, a disconnected bride. A bride that's okay with his absence. A bride that's okay with him staying up there another hundred years. He is going to awaken a bride who misses him. Who wants him. Who longs for him. Who loves him. Who adores him. The first commandment will be first place in the church before the Lord returns. Right now it's about tenth place. But before Jesus returns it will be first place. Loving God with every fiber of our being. He's going to do it. He's going to pour that Romans 5.5. 5. Can you put Romans 5.5 5 up here? I'm just going to take, we're going to run with her. Romans 5.5, 5, he says this, that you would pour the love of God. This is it. Now hope does not disappoint. Because the love of God has been poured out into our hearts by the Holy Spirit who was given to us. I want you to begin to ask the Holy Spirit, the Father, to pour the love of God into your heart by the Holy Spirit. I literally want you to start praying that prayer. Say, Father, repeat after me. Say, Father, pour the love of God into my heart by the Holy Spirit. That is a prayer I want you to start praying because it takes God to love God. It takes God to love God. You don't love God by just, mm. you, loving God is a response to his love for you. Amen. So the posture of our hearts is receiving his affections so we can love him. Can you put 1 John 4, 18 up here and 19? And then we're going to get to kind of what I'm feeling tonight, but we just got so wrecked in the love of God tonight. The Lord was singing over us. The Lord was singing. You know, that's how the Lord heals trauma is through love songs. That's how God heals trauma. 
And we might look at another verse for that just to have fun. 1 John 4.18. 1 John 4.18. Get it up there. Because I don't remember it. <laughs> there is no fear in love, but perfect love cast out fear. Because fear involves torment. But he who fears has not been made perfect in love. Here it is. We love him because he first, everybody say first, first. loved us. God's the initiator, we're the responder. And you will only love God to the degree you understand his love for you. And it's the love of God that breaks the power of fear that breaks the power of the fear of abandonment, fear of rejection, fear of failure. All the fears that cripple the human heart are broken by the power of love. And when the love of God freely and fully washes you, it liberates you from fear. I really feel like the Lord is doing a work of freedom in Maine in this season. He's doing it all over the body of Christ. But he is really doing a work of freedom. And I think we're in a season of repentance. We're in a season of repentance, which is, break, which is changing the way we think, but even preparing the ground of our hearts for all that God wants to do in this next season. Okay, I want to just throw some verses at you because this is all about preparing a highway for the love of God to hit you at a greater way because we can quote these verses. It's beautiful, but we have strongholds that are resisting the revelation of God on the inside of us. We have lies, strongholds, and arguments that fortresses where demons are are held that are resisting the truth of God's love. We can quote it, hallelujah, praise God, but yet most of us feel disconnected from the love of God and God wants to break it. Put 2 Corinthians 10, 4, and 5 up here. Put 2 Corinthians 10, 3 through 5. And I just want to hit some, I have a lot of scattered verses in my heart tonight, but at the end of the day, it's repentance, it's preparation, for the encounter with the love of God. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. And I, and I talk to you about books. We also have a massive online community. And right now we're in the middle of a spiritual warfare uh, course this month. And so this is one of the big ones that we're hitting. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds. Casting down arguments. There are arguments and there are high things that exalt themselves against the knowledge of God. They're in your thought life. They're fortresses in your thought life. There's arguments. And they exalt themselves against the knowledge of God. And our call is to bring every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. So Paul is going to use a good reality which are strongholds, which are defense systems built around ancient cities. And he's going, those same defense systems are being used by the enemy and the defense systems are in your thought life, in your emotions, and they're harboring lies, half-truths, and demonic influences that are resisting the truth of God and who he is towards you. That these things have been built through life's experiences and we're, and we're living in a fallen world and these, these fortresses are resisting the truth of God's word. Resisting the truth of God's love. Resisting the truth of God. And Paul goes, we're coming through meekness and gentleness to pull down strongholds. To cast down arguments to break every thought and to bring it to the obedience of Christ Jesus. He wants to teach you how to fight. He wants to deliver us from meetings only. He wants to deliver us from fire tunnels only. 
He wants to deliver you from falling down for the 10 billion time only and not waking up and beginning to walk around meditating in the word of God and beginning to take authority over lies that keep you bound in addiction, that keep you bound in lies and cycles. And he wants us to begin to engage our will at another level of learning how to fight because you have a part to play. I've been in every glorious meeting there is, and at the end of the day, I gotta go home and read my Bible. I gotta go home and get down on my knees. I gotta make choices with my life. There is no, I can, I can enjoy the afterglow of that meeting, but until I open my Bible and talk to God, nothing truly changes. And I believe God's wanting to grow the charismatic church up God wants to grow the charismatic church up from meetings only Christianity into discipleship, into feeding on the word of God and preparation at the heart level. Can you put Hosea chapter 10 verse 12 up here? Going to give you a lot of verses and we'll hopefully weave this whole thing together. Hosea, good job. Sow for yourselves. Well, I want pastor to do it for me. No, you're going to do it. Sow for yourselves righteousness, reap in mercy. Look at this phrase. Here's the phrase I want you to think about. Break up your fallow ground. Okay? Think about that. He's going to liken your heart to the soil outside. And he's going, I want you to see that hard, stony, weedy ground. And I want you to understand that's indicative of your heart It was useful in a previous season. It bore fruit and brought forth life in a previous season, but through rain and weathering, it's gotten hard. And children of Israel, children of Maine, hear me. You need to break up your fallow ground. You need to break up the soil of your heart because you can't sow seed on hard ground. It needs a fresh breaking. It needs fresh repentance and a fresh tenderizing so that it can handle this season's seed. Break up your fallow ground, for it is time. Everybody say it's time. To seek the Lord till he comes and rains righteousness on you. I say this all the time. I want to say it to you again. I believe God is giving us three gifts in the aiding of the breaking up of our fallow ground. Tears that tenderize the soil. Tongues that till up the soil. And travail that tears the soil. Tears, tongues, and travail is coming to the church. And it's the spirit of prayer on the other side of words. There's a depth and a desperation that he's working in his people in this hour, saying, I'm tired of living on the merry-go-round of the same cycles. And I'm looking to break through the places that I've lived. Can you put Joel 2.12 up here? He's going to give us the gift of tears to tenderize us. Now, therefore, says the Lord, look at this, Turn to me with all your heart. Everybody say all. He goes, how? He goes, I got a gift. Here's another gift, fasting. I saw you preached on fasting a month ago. Fasting is a gift to tenderize the soil of your hearts. If I had time, we would talk about fasting. Fasting puts your soul in the back seat and the Holy Spirit takes the front seat. And you get quiet in your soul as you get delivered from all the other voices. And his voice goes from a tapping hammer to a sledgehammer. Fasting weakens your strongholds. Fasting weakens the fortresses so that the whispers of God's love hit you like a battering ram. It's not earning anything from God. It's making yourself vulnerable to the word of God. 
Because you realize I have resistance systems that the enemy has been seeking to build within me for the last 30 years, and I need to weaken my resistance to truth so truth hits me like a wrecking ball. I want liberty. I want arguments cast down. I want to feel loved. Not just know I loved, I want to feel loved. I want to feel enjoyed. That's my question to you. Do you feel enjoyed by God? Because you, it won't ever touch your emotions until it cracks through your mind. Turn to me with all your heart, fasting, weeping, and mourning. We talked a little bit about mourning last night. That weeping spirit, that spirit of tenderizing. Tears tenderize the soil of our hearts. Go to verse 13, look at this one. Rend your heart. Not your garments. Tear your heart. Return to God. Why? Because He's gracious. He's merciful. He's slow to anger. And here's one of my favorite revelations of God He's of great kindness. Do you tell God He's kind? Do you tell God He's a good leader? Or do you mostly complain about his leadership? He's a kind God. He relents from doing harm. Everybody say, tear your heart. Say, break up your fallow ground. Say, cast down arguments. Look, put Isaiah chapter 40, verse 3 up here. Isaiah 40, verse 3. Hallelujah. Good job. Isaiah 40, verse 3. The voice of one, Isaiah 40, crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. God's got to first do it in you before he does it through you. He wants to do it in the church of Maine and all over New England right now in this hour. He wants to build a highway within before he releases a message without. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Verse 4. He says this, Every valley shall be exalted. Every mountain and hill brought low. Crooked places, keep this up here, shall be made straight. Rough places smooth. I want you to picture your interior life as having valleys of self-hatred, valleys to where you are not secure in the love of God, valleys that are mostly living in regret because of past seasons. And you cannot, no matter how many times you hear it, can believe that God actually loves you, not even likes you. And there are valleys on the inside of us that when the love of God hits you, God wants to raise those valleys up on the inside of you. He wants every mountain and hill, which is pride, self-sufficiency, independence, arrogance, flexing in your own strength, brought low. He wants the crooked places made straight. He wants the rough places made smooth. We're going to have to have a people that are going to do the interior work and do a spiritual work for this region. It's not rocket scientists. It's a law. It's corporate humility. It's individuals that make up corporate realities that are humbling themselves on a consistent basis to pray for the glory. Look, look at the next verse, verse five. He says this: "For the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all flesh shall see it together. For the mouth of the Lord is spoken." God wants to visit our region with glory. He wants to visit your interior life with glory. You have wells all over New England that, are, that, have, that God has breathed on in past seasons. 
but it's got to require another generation that's going to do the work of the previous generation. We can live in the scourge and the, and the scorn of the work of the evil one and talk more about that, but if I believe in a Second Chronicles 7.14 people, that if they truly humble themselves and turn and seek God's face, he will turn and release a blessing. I believe in the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. But it's going to be so disruptive. It's going to literally change everything. It's so invasive. It's so confrontational to our normal ideas and lives as good Bible-believing Christians that it's going to require so much more than we're ready or willing to give. We'll buy books. We'll go to conferences. We'll, we'll go to all the things, but to actually shift our personal lives when no one's watching, shift schedules, shift financial, shift things, it requires so much more than we're really honestly willing to give. And the Holy Spirit is inviting us to move from fire tunnels into readjusting schedules. We need hours of meditating in the Word. We need to get around singing realities. We, I need Dana's voice. We need musicians. We need a generation to come out and to begin to get aggressive on the inside of repentance. Repentance is not a sad altar call. It's a life of swimming upstream and declaring war and breaking through strongholds, casting down arguments. Will we do it? Can we just get a couple of you? All we need is a couple to break open ground. I mean, we talk about great revivals in history. It usually you got two old women in the Hebrides that literally, two old women, one leaned over and the other one blind. One leaned over with, with arthritis and the other one blind, and they prayed in a year revival that shook a whole island off of Scotland. We got Frank Bartleman in Azusa Street. You got Daniel Nash in the Second Great Awakening. You got David Brainerd in the First Great Awakening. You've got intercessors, just one, that says, my God, I need you for real. And I'll give you my life. I'll give you my schedule. God, I want you to move in this generation. It's not okay. And so I'm feeling all kinds of things. I feel repentance. I feel preparation. I feel casting down of strongholds. In preparation for all that he wants to do in this hour. Can you look with me in John 8, 31? Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. You're going to do it, Jesus. If you abide in my word, you're my disciples. And if you abide long enough, verse 32, you're going to begin to know truth. And when you begin to know truth and the virus is let loose on the inside of you, you'll start getting free. Live in the Bible till truth gets in you and then all the lies get obliterated. Oh, that God will release a great tenderizing through this region. We could just get a couple of 20-year-olds. Get a couple of 20-year-olds just to shut it down and say we're going to seek God until. Go 
God wants to raise up preparation ministries in wildernesses. He wants to raise up forerunner intercessory movements in wildernesses that prepare highways in deserts. Preparing highways in deserts for glory, to prepare for glory. And the glory is the revelation of Jesus. Glory is the revelation of Jesus. Glory is the revelation of Jesus. Casting down every argument, every thought, and bringing it to the obedience of Christ. A church that's submitted to God in every area will be the church that resists the devil and he flees. Can you put Isaiah 44, verse 3 up here? Thank you, Holy Spirit. We love you. He's going to do it, but is he going to do it in you? I'm going to pour out water on him who's thirsty. Floods on the dry ground. I'm going to pour out my spirit on your descendants and my blessing on your offspring. I will pour water on him who is thirsty. I'm going to pour floods on dry ground. I'm going to pour my spirit on your descendants and my blessing on your offspring. He goes, break up your fallow ground, for I'm going to come and rain righteousness on you. He wants to rain righteousness on the ground. He wants to release something in the heart of his people. And I'm mostly not even preaching to you tonight. I'm not. I'm not talking to you. I'm preaching to a region, a hundred mile radius. I'm preaching to New England tonight. Say, can we see a generation that would come forth? I don't want to talk about statistics. I want to begin to contend as Hannah's for a Samuel generation to come forth. We need wild ones that break through all of our protocols. We need seasons of fasting to come upon us. We need fasting until there's the breaking of the silence. We need fasting until there's the breaking of the silence. We need fasting until we get our voice back. We need fasting until we get our voice back. We need prayer until we get our voice back. We need humility until we get our voice back. That's what breaks the power of the evil one is humility. He disarmed principalities and powers through the cross. It's the humility of the cross that breaks the power of principalities and powers. It's the lives that are submitted to God in secret that break the power of evil over regions. It's Daniel. Can you put up here, honey? Daniel 10, verse 12. Daniel 10, verse 12. Thank you, God. Thank you. This is an angel showing up to Daniel on the 21st day. And he says, Daniel, for from the first day, you set your heart to understand, and look at this, and to humble yourself before your God. Your words were heard, and I've come because of your words. An angel said, I've come because you said words. An angel shows up to him on the 21st day saying, because you didn't shut up, I didn't stop coming. 
I believe that humility activates the angelic. I believe humility and prayer and fasting and de- declaration of the promises of God, no matter how weak it feels, no matter how unproductive it feels, no matter how in- impactful it feels, I believe it activates the angelic. I believe it activates and shifts seasons. Set your heart to understand your words were heard. I've come because of your words. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. Can you put Joel 2.15 up here? Thank you, Jesus. We love you. Oh, we need a corporate revelation again. We need corporate revelation. I love my personal quiet time with Jesus. But corporate insanity in culture requires corporate gatherings of prayer and fasting. We're going to counteract corporate and cultural insanity with corporate gatherings. Which is going to require you to change things in your schedule. Which is going to be a little more invasive disruptive blow the trumpet in Zion consecrate a fast call a sacred assembly keep going let's run let's run consecrate call assemble gather next verse let's go blow consecrate gather sanctify assemble gather you get children in there let the bridegroom we're going to mess up early marriages newlyweds are going to forge histories in prayer and fasting next verse leaders need to who minister to the lord let them weep there it is between the porch and the altar and let them say spare your people o lord Have we tears? Have we tears? Where are your tears at? Where are your tears at? When's the last time the spirit of prayer came on you and you began to weep and plead for the breakthrough of God in this region? Tenderize your hearts. Rend your hearts. Break your hearts until you feel again. Until you get God's heart again. It's time for fresh tears. It's time for corporate tears. It's time for leaders who cry. Let them say, spare your people, O Lord. Don't give your heritage to reproach. Verse 18, look at this. Then it says, why should they say, where is their God? Sounds like culture's statement concerning the church, our irrelevance, because we're in bed with political parties. Because we're in bed and we've lost our voice in the spirit because we sold it in other places. we got to get our voice back in the throne room for us to get it back into culture. Or we become irrelevant. Look at God's response to this. If you'll see the corporate gathering, look at what he'll say we'll do. Next verse. Then the Lord will be zealous for his land. And he will pity his people. Keep going. Verse 19. Ha. Then the Lord will answer and say, I'm going to send you grain and new wine and oil. You will be satisfied by them. I will no longer make you a reproach among the nations. Next verse. I will remove from you the northern army. Next verse. Verse 21. Next verse. Next verse. Do not be, go to the next verse going to be awesome be glad then you children of zion rejoice in the lord your god he has given you the former rain faithfully he will cause the rain to come down for you the former rain and the latter rain in the first month something with rain verse 24 i'm going to send rain the threshing floors shall be full of wheat vats shall overflow with new wine and oil verse 25 This is a word for some of you. I'm going to restore to you years. 
years, years that have been lost, restored in the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Keep going just because I want to get to 28. It's going to be awesome. Verse 27, it's going to be awesome. You're going to know I'm in your midst. Verse 28, it's going to come to pass afterward. I'm going to pour out my spirit. Pour out my spirit, and I'm going to restore the spirit of prophecy. Creative power on the word of God again. I believe with all my heart, I can feel God's invitation to the remnant here, as well as intercessors all over this region. I believe we're in a Psalm 2 crisis. It demands a Joel 2 response, which will result with an Acts 2 outpouring. We're living in corporate and cultural insanity where we're seeking to overthrow God and his word. Understand, it's a demonic corporate unity. It's a demonic corporate agenda. There are principalities and powers behind what you see. There are agendas. There are demonic agendas, and it's a corporate demonic unity. Understand it. Everyone's in agreement, and the church is scattered. Church is scattered. All the denominations, all the different takes, our generation, a whole generation is leaving the church. And I'm watching last night the Southern Baptist Convention fighting over whether women can preach. <laughs> Having full on debates that that's what's taking up. The hour that we're living in is whether women can preach. And we've got a generation that's leaving. We've got so much confusion sexual confusion, gender confusion, fatherlessness in the home. The breakdown of culture and a church is debating. And we're not on our faces. And we're not crying out to God to shift the season. And to have mercy on us. And not let us become a byword. We need God. We need Him. We need Him. We need Him. I need Him. You need Him. We need Him. We need a unity that bypasses our denominationals. That bypasses, that transcends denominational creeds and all of our little islands. we got to come off our islands. Church of Maine, Church of New England, come off your islands. Come into the house of prayer. Gather in humility. Gather in fasting. Cry out to God. Cry out to God until he sends the Holy Ghost and has mercy on this generation. And I, he can, I, just, I just want him to do it in me. That's why God led me. And it's everywhere. It's not like, well, we just got to be more like Texas. I've been in the Bible Belt my whole life. And I'd rather go to a post-Christian society like Denver and put my stake in the ground, saying, you're going to do it here. Because I find it's a lot Easier to pray in Denver than it is in Dallas where you got a million churches on every corner. And everybody knows Jesus, but there's no humility and we're so bled in to the culture. I declare that Jesus Christ is King. I declare that Jesus Christ is Lord. I declare that Jesus Christ is seated at the right hand of the Father far above every principality, every ruler, and every dominion. Jesus Christ is King. Jesus Christ is King. Jesus Christ is King. 
Have your glory in New England, Jesus. Have your glory in New England. God, I pray, let it break down from in our hearts and let it open up the heavens. I pray that a concert of prayer and fasting would explode beginning now at the sound of my voice. That there would be an eruption of concerts of prayer and fasting all over this region, God. I ask you to raise up trumpets in this region. Raise up trumpets, God. Trumpets of alarm. Trumpets of gathering. Trumpets that would prepare. Trumpets that would call people to rend. That would call people to break up. Ah, we plead it, God. Amen? Let's stand. It doesn't even feel like a message. It's just a groan. Okay? Sometimes it's not about the message you're going to get tonight. I'm just coming to give you a groan. Yeah. Uh, Thank you, God. He's going to do it. I know he's going to do it. But when I feel that thing, I just... That mocking spirit, you mocking spirit, I declare that Jesus Christ is king, and that there's going to be a radiant bride come forth out of this region. When they say, where is their God? Let the priest who minister to the Lord weep between the porch and the altar. Let them say, spare your people, O God. Why should they say among the nations, where is their God? Then the Lord will be zealous for his land. 